Tonight on the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries. One of the, the sort of good things and bad things about basic research is that you, know, you don't necessarily have a plan for what you're trying to do. Dr. Rick Rashid was the first employee of Microsoft Research. He's run the lab for more than 20 years. The impact of his work and leadership has been felt throughout the world. Rick shared his revolutionary insights with John Markoff of the New York Times. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. You know, I wanted to start, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time looking forward, but I wanted to start by looking backward because we're at the Computer History Museum. And we're old. <laughs> and we're getting older by the day. Um, My wife made this joke uh, as I was coming here that I was going to be on display at the Computer History Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the permanent exhibition, I think. <laughs> well, one of the things that you did first in your career, actually before you started your career, that influenced me a lot, actually, um, was Alto Trek. And so I really wanted to start with the story of Alto Trek. I understand it as either the first or one of the first network computer uh, games. You were a graduate student at Rochester. Um, how did you get your hands on an Alto, and who let you do something fun with it? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. So I was in the, the group of sort of incoming first graduate students at, at Rochester. So Jerry Feldman, who was associate director of the AI lab at Stanford, uh, he went to the University of Rochester to start their department of computer science. And he went out, he didn't obviously have a real admissions process that year, but I was a student at Stanford, I'd been taking a lot of courses there. And so he approached me uh, to say, you know, would you like to be in this first group of, of, of students? And uh, Jerry had a lot of contacts with, with Xerox Park. And, and of course, the University of Rochester had a lot of relationships with Xerox, because we, Xerox was a, you know, a, a long time you know, uh, participant, the university and, the, and Xerox were, you know, had sort of interlocking directorates you know, in terms of the board of trustees and, and the, and the uh, board of the company. And so there was, there was some good relationships there. And uh, Jerry was able to leverage those good relationships to get access to four Xerox Altos. So Rochester was actually the very first place outside of Xerox Park, you know, outside of Xerox proper, to have access to Altos. Had you and seen an Alto before you went to Rochester? I, I had not. Well, I didn't even see one when I got there. We, we got our first Alto at the end of the first year I was there. Uh, before that, so the, for the first year I was at Rochester, our entire computing facility consisted of a Bendix logic port terminal and a CI Stylus 700. That was our printer. Uh, and we were using the SumX AIM uh, you know, facility at Stanford because Jerry was able to you know, again, leverage his old relationships to do that um, over the old Telenet. Right? So this was, you know, it, it was just barely computing you know, back then. And uh, when the Altos came, it was, it was just amazing. I remember that when we first unpacked the very first one, they had no instructions. I mean, they'd never really shipped this to anybody outside of Xerox at the time. And so there was nothing that really described, you know, exactly what it would do. And the, I remember we turned the thing on, we put in the, the, the cartridge drive, right, which was, you know, I think like three megabytes or something. It was about maybe this big maybe around. Maybe five, three to five, know. yeah. And uh, we put that thing in, and we turned it on, and I typed something, I forget what it was, and I think it was like a search F or something, and it started going munge, 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 and putting up the names of all the files on the machine. And I thought, oh my God, I've destroyed. Here's this, that we have one of these, you know, <laughs> it just showed up, and now I've done this simple thing where I've initiated some command, and it's, it's like deleting every file on the disk. <laughs> Uh, this is not an experience a young graduate student really wants to have. Uh, but it was fun, you know, it, 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 was, it was doing something called F-Munger uh, for those uh, Xerox uh, aficionados out there. And all it was doing was just printing out information about the files, right? But I was just panicked. Uh, 
But uh, yeah, so we had those really early on, and th that was a great opportunity for me to, to really be able to program them. Now, there had been a Trek game that would, would have been text-based that had been around in mainframe computers for a long time. Right, it was in Fortran. It was in Fortran. Why Trek? Was that... Uh, oh, I was just, you know, I was just a big Trek fan. You know, uh, I remember at Stanford when I was a, a, a student there as an undergraduate, uh, you know, we would do dinner every night, you know, in the, in the dorms. We would watch the, the, the reruns of the Star Trek episodes. So, you know, it was just a lot of fun for me. And, and, and um, Gene Ball was the graduate student that worked with me on, on Alto Trek. And we just, you know, we, we wanted to do something fun. We wanted to do a game. Um, unfortunately, you know, the Altos were, were so slow that you really had to do some unique things. So I had to write the whole, f uh, it didn't have floating points, but I had to write the floating point library in microcode <laughs> in order to be able to do floating point. And then there were some things that were just too expensive. So I just couldn't take a square root, right? It was just way too expensive to take a square root. So I remember for, for gravity, I came up with the idea of using Manhattan distance. Um, and, and surprisingly, you could put something in orbit, you know, with Manhattan distance as your gravity which I thought was really fun. I just, I, I enjoyed that idea. Was this a side uh, project or was this research? Or was no, this, was a, this was just fun. So you were this was just a side project. I mean, we, we just were having a good time. And did you, um, were you treating this as a personal computer? Did you understand that this was a personal computer when you, when you had it, or? Well, I think the best, best way I would say is we were treating it as our only computer. <laughs> 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 I mean, this was, I mean, it, we knew it was a unique resource, right? Uh, but we also were just about that same time we we had gotten a um, data general eclipse system, and so that was sort of our kind of server thing. That was kind of our, our central system, and then we, these four altos were really our our resource for doing development around the. And were they tied problem. together by an Ethernet at that point? Yeah, we had an Ethernet tying them together. In fact, that was really the the, the, the one of the fun things about AltoTrack was that uh, you know the. In the, the old three megabit Ethernet had this feature, which was uh, promiscuity for the, you, so basically there was a, a, an eight bit code for each, uh, for each machine on the network that you could set, right? So you could be any machine you wanted to be. And um, if, if, you, if zero was, was um, broadcast, you could broadcast to everybody, or you had a specific number associated with it. And so one of the things I did, for AltaCheck is I wanted to have the equivalent of multicast. I mean, multicast hadn't really been invented in quite that way yet, but I needed to have a way for machines to be competing with each other in, in a single solar system, uh, but not bothering other machines, right? Because uh, it was just, again, y if you start bombarding everybody with, with broadcast, everything would slow down, you know, because processing Ethernet packets was a lot of work for these little machines that had very slow instruction sets. So, uh, so I basically took the, the top 16 addresses and I made them the 16 sort of planetary clusters or, or galaxies or, or sorry star systems that we had, and so each whenever a ship went into one of these systems, it became it used that uh, that that address that Ethernet address. So the, the the funny part of that was that eventually the game we, we everybody loved it. We played it a lot. It, you know, uh, eventually it got imported back to Xerox <coughs> Park, and. And people really loved playing it Which there. Which was where I saw it. You probably saw it at Xerox. So everybody who enjoyed playing it there. It was a lot of fun. But they didn't actually know how it worked, right? And, of course, they had lots of altos. We only had four. They had lots of altos. And, and there were altos in those addresses, okay, <laughs> that were being used. <laughs> and so, th this, as the story was told to me, when, um, when the, uh, uh, it got to be like 5 o'clock or something and everybody was starting to play instead of work, uh, the, and that's the story I was told at least. Uh, they might have played all the time. <laughs> but the, there were certain machines that would just slow down terribly, all right? And no one understood why, you know? And eventually, I think either I told them or somebody explained to them how the, how the thing actually worked. So amusingly enough, you know, a, f a few years later, I, went, I became a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And, and as I arrived, they were getting their first Alto. So this is, this is the fall of 1979. And, uh, and, but they did have a manual. By that time, they, 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 you know, right. MIT and Stanford and Carnegie Mellon were giving little manuals describing how these things actually work. And in the, in the description of the Ethernet, uh, I remember seeing that the, the top 16 addresses were documented as reserved for Trek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I thought that was great. So, 
So indirectly, I invented multipass for the <laughs> Ethernet, very indirectly. This is one of those, one of those stories we'll get to. Um, you didn't study computer science directly at Stanford. You studied math and comparative literature. Right. What, uh, and I began to wonder, so you were also uh, a Star Trekky even at Stanford. Did you come to Star Trek via science fiction or did you come to science fiction via Star Trek? What was the inspiration? Uh, I was a science fiction fan from the time I was a little kid. You know, I read the Mushroom Planet books, you know, back in the old days. And there's, <laughs> there's a fan. Uh, you know, I've, and I, I read, I think, any, anything that looked like science fiction, Asimov, Heinlein, anything, yeah. you know, uh, I, just, I just absorbed them. Okay. Um, I would read them so fast, it was hard, you know, I would just sort of park myself in the library because it was just hard to, to get past. Um, but you didn't study, you, you didn't major in computer science. There was no major in computer science. I in the late 60s, I think it's No, uh, no the, there was no major in computer science in, uh, it, until after I left for sure. I'm not sure what year it started. Um, there were courses, okay. and I took a bunch of courses. So I took, you know, I took a lot of, of computer science courses, um, and, you know, so I had probably the rough equivalent of what would have been an undergraduate computer science degree too. But we just didn't didn't okay. have one, you know. But uh, comparative literature I got into because I was a foreign exchange student in Italy for a year, so that got me into for into literature and other languages, and then mathematics was always something I enjoyed. Okay. Would you have called yourself a hacker at that point in your uh, in the I, white hat sense of the, of the well, I, I mean, in those days, I think you, everybody liked to think of themselves as hackers, right? That was the term we used. Uh, you know, I really, you know, to me, what was really fun was the, and the reason I got excited about computer science was this that you know here was my intellect really animating this piece of of metal, right? This device. Uh, I remember I took the an, an architecture course. It was the second course I took at Stanford from uh, Fourth Bastard. And the, we had these uh, 2116 A and B machines that were sort of tucked away in a corner, you know, in, in, the, in the quad. And, the, uh, you know, you'd have to, I mean, usually I'd have to get them access to it at, at night because they'd be used all during the day and stuff. And so you, they're only, you know, you'd have to compete with all the other students and people that were using them. And I just remember the very first time I was able to read a paper tape you know, sort everything in, in memory and, and write it back out on a, on a you know, ASR 33. I just thought this was like, this was like, <laughs> I floated. I mean, I, it was like midnight when I got my program running. I just literally floated across campus, you know, back to, back to the dorm room. Because <laughs> it was just so exciting. You, to me, it was so visceral. And I think that's really why I wound up going into operating systems, right? Because, for, again, you know, I just loved the, the working at this very low oh. level, yeah. working at the hardware. And uh, so, uh, was operating if you're, uh, were operating systems your focus at Rochester? The, I mean, was that sort of? Uh, that was, a, you know, I, I mostly did operating systems work. So if you look at, uh, you know, as, I was, as I was a, uh, a, a graduate student, you know, a, a lot of what I did, you know, we developed something called the RIG operating system for Rochester Intelligent Gateway. And we published a number of papers on that. Um, so, so a lot, and certainly a lot of the ideas that eventually became important in my work on Accent and Moth, they all came out of the work I did, you know, when I was in Rochester, you know, as I was developing my ideas of, of how I would structure that operating system and how it would function. Um, but I did a lot of other stuff as a graduate student. I mean, I also did a year of clinical neurolinguistics, uh, working at Strong Hospital. I did. Your graduate, uh, your graduate thesis was on computer vision. I, I did, a, you know, it was in, in, in motion computer vision, right? So I worked on something called moving light displays that were these moving images where you put points on a body and move it around and then you, you can reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the object. Um, so so I, I tended to work on things that, that I enjoyed and things I had fun. Um, I wanted to ask about what led to Mach. Um, wh what were the roots of Mach? Uh, why, why? Well, I mean, the Mach operating system really came out of ideas that go back to the rig operating system work that I did when I was at Rochester. So, you know, the it, RIG was the first time, I mean, I, I actually remember as I was, I was sitting in the student union and I started to realize that there was a, a that I could, um, you know, build this relationship between, between um, you know, message passing and communication and memory and memory management. That those things could be thought of du as duals of each other. 
um, and that you could think of them as, as being the basis for a set of primitives for an operating system. And so, uh, I mean, uh, the, the general Eclipse that we actually implemented, I actually implemented that on, was, you know, really not, it didn't really have a full memory management system and paging system. But um, when I went to um, CMU, you know, there we had, again, an early machine, the, the Freebirds Corporation Pura. And, and I could microprogram it to do anything I wanted to do. So I designed an instruction set and I wrote the microcode so that it could provide all the facilities I would need to have you know, a, a system based on a very small set of communication and memory primitives uh, that then I could you know, layer on top of. So in some sense, the, the original ideas came from the, my original work at Rochester um, I refined them and really, you know, came to understand what they meant and how they functioned with the work on Accent. And then Mock was in some sense, you know, the 3.0, right? You know how they, people always say it's always the third version. You know, the, the first version is the, is the one you, you had to do, but you shipped it early, okay? The second version was what you thought you, you what were going to do in the first one, but you don't have any feedback on how it was really going to work out. And the third one is you really understand what you're doing. And I think for me, you know, my 3.0 was, was mock. Yeah. I, I want to ask more about mock, but before I go further, what predisposed you to math from your family? Was there something that... Uh, for my family? Well, yeah, was it family or was it something <laughs> else? Was there what... what uh, well, my parents didn't go to college, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, there wasn't, you know, my dad was really good with numbers, but that, you know... But do you think that was a possible uh, influence? Did you have you that? Know, I, I don't really know. I, I just got, I, I must say, I think the reason I got into mathematics was I went to Stanford, and you know, I got in the you know first year math math course there, and I just had a blast. Yeah. And you know, after that, I uh, the, the second semester I got into the math honors program, you know, which was just a you know just a huge amount of fun. Yeah. You know, and uh, we had a professor uh, Manham Schiffer that that was teaching that particular course, and he had this philosophy of you know if I haven't said it in class, it's not true, right? I have to prove everything from the beginning to the, to the end. And you know, I, I just learned to love math from, from the way he taught. Okay. So I, w I was thinking on the way down here about how your software is in almost every, it's probably in every device I use and how ironic that is in some ways um, as a Mac person. Um, and I, w I was wondering if, um, if Steve ever tried to recruit you. Uh, I'm not, you know, not sure exactly the right, right way of saying that. He certainly wanted to hire me. Uh, recruit me is a different issue. I mean, he wanted to, <laughs> he wanted to pay me. Uh, and, and I think the, you know, either consultant or something, you know. And, you know, those days, my philosophy when I was at, at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon was that I didn't, you know, I'm a, I did consulting work for companies from time to time, but I would never do consulting work about my work on operating systems. Because my feeling was that I wanted uh, to have, you know, I, I didn't want to have any, any perceived bias in who I worked with or what I, what I was doing. So I wanted everybody to, uh, that I could talk to to use what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want them to feel like I was beholden to somebody else. Yeah. Right? So we work with Apple, we work with, with Next, we work with, with Intel, we work with uh, Digital, we work with the Open Software Foundation, you know, just anybody. In, you know, I, I was willing to talk to anybody and share my code with anybody. Before going on more with technology, I, I wanted to uh, sort of ask a general question about um, the relationship between entertainment. So we started with we started with uh, your, your work on AltaTrack, and I, I, just the relationship between entertainment and the advance of computer science. And if there is anything more than sort of random interaction, or whether computer science has been driven forward in a meaningful way by the entertainment world. Well, I you know I, th I think there's always been I'm not, I don't know. How you how you want to describe it as being in a meaningful way, but I think there's always been you know a, uh, you know, a lot of interest in you know how computers can you know entertain people and and I think a lot of the, the the early people that I knew certainly that got into computer science you know they enjoyed playing games on the computers they enjoyed writing games for the computers um, you know whether they were text based games or whether they were you know later on graphical games. You know whether it was things like you know moon landing or you know missile command or any, any you know, whatever whatever you were you were interested in in those days and I and I think that you know it has 
certainly, um, you know, as gaming has gotten more interesting and more sophisticated, it has brought advances. I mean, so you look at, at a lot of the work that's gone into, you know, 3D graphics and, and making the graphics better. Well, that has gone hand in hand with the use of graphics in games and, and the fact that you know, there was a lot driving you know, the, the development of better graphics boards as people wanted to have more games and better experiences. So I, I think there's, you know, there is a relationship and there's always been a, a sort of a, you know, an entertainment and education component to using computers. What persuaded you to leave academia and go to Microsoft? Uh, you know, it was interesting because it was kind of a, uh, I would sort of characterize it as a hard decision and, and in fact, you know, I was being recruited um, by Nathan Mirbold at, at Microsoft to start Microsoft Research. And he, he, would, he worked really hard for, for a number of months. And I would keep telling him no. And, and the reason I would keep telling him no I was, in a sense, I, I, I sort of felt a lot of loyalty to Carnegie Mellon. I'd been there for 12 years. I'd been very successful there. And, you know, and also I was feeling kind of torn, too, because of the people um, that, I, that I knew there. And, and you know, they, they had some expectations. Uh, you know, there was a, um, at the same time, Microsoft was trying to recruit me to start Microsoft Research. Um, the university was trying to recruit me to be dean of, of the school. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and this is also a period during which, you know, as uh, Alan Newell, you know, who's at, at CMU, is the, um, one of the, the, the great, you know, founders of that department, um, you know, he was dying of cancer during that period. And he was one of my mentors, one of the people I really looked up to. And, and I could tell, you know, we had a number of conversations that uh, he really wanted me to stay. <laughs> I think he was thinking about, he wants somebody to be there for the next generation, right, from uh, the people that he knew and that he trusted. Uh, but I will also uh, say that Alan gave me just incredible advice about, you know, what I would, what I would need to do when I, when I did go to Microsoft. And, and, you know, I really look back at that time as being, you know, really seminal in terms of formulating, you know, the way I thought about what I would do as I started Microsoft Research and really taking Alan's advice to heart. Was the charter that um, uh, Nathan held out to you some creating something like one of the, I mean, were you trying to create a Bell Labs or were you trying to create an IBM Research or a Xerox PARC? What, what was your mission when you went? Uh, actually, I was trying to create a Carnegie Mellon Computer Science Department, you know, in a company. Um, I mean, that was literally my model. And if you go back to even the talks I gave in the early days, I always said that. You know, my model was, I mean, I, I was, you know, I had been sort of, you know, raised, you know, at, at Carnegie Mellon as a professor, and that was my model for how you did, you know, cutting edge computer science. Um, you know, obviously CMU always had a strong relationship to industry as well. I mean, going back, you know, many years, and, you know, I always felt that that was a great, the, the way the department ran, the sort of egalitarian structure of the department, uh, the, the, the lack of bureaucracy, the, the, um, the reasonable person principle, all of those things were to me sort of how I thought, you know, you should run a computer science department. And, you know, and when I went to Microsoft, I mean, as I was even being interviewed with, with Bill um, and with Nathan, I mean, that's what I said, look, if I come here, that's what I want to do. I want to create something that was like what CMU was like, but do it in the context of a software company where the output of that entity could go directly into products and really could make a big difference. So, so really that was my mental model. And honestly, I didn't know Bell Labs, I knew some of IBM research, but I didn't know Bell Labs all that remarkably well. So I wouldn't have been able to use it as a model. But now the, 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 the institution you've created is, is so, di so, so much beyond the notion of a, of a computer science department, it, it spans you know, many of the world's continents. It, uh, it, it does things that are short term. It does things that are very blue sky. I mean, it's beginning to look like, you know, a, a Bell Labs or an IBM Research to my mind. Or a university. <laughs> uh, I, was, I remember I was meeting with, the, I think, the, the, the president of Brown, and I was point, pointing out that we had more PhDs than, than they did at Brown. Uh, is the number 850? Is that, is that yeah, we have about 850 PhDs. The total organization size is about 1,100. Uh, but the uh, uh, yeah no it, it you know, we it's in, it's been interesting I think partly what's happened is that you know uh, and I think of this more as a growth of the field of computer science you know the, you know Microsoft research has grown and it has expanded the number of areas in which we work but 
that's really a reflection of the fact that the field of computer science has just changed dramatically, you know, in the last 20 years. You know, and it has grown to encompass a lot of other fields, or at least to reach out into a lot of other fields, right? So where we do work, for example, in, uh, we do work in AIDS research and, and looking at new kinds of vaccines. We look at things like malaria. But we're looking at it from the perspective of how do you apply machine learning, right, to tackle those problems? How do you apply computer vision algorithms that were designed for one purpose to attack another kind of recognition problem, you know, in looking at, um, at, at, at certain kinds of genetic structures. So I think, you know, what's happened is as the field of computer science has grown, we've grown to go with it. You know, and also Microsoft has grown. I mean, the company is, is nothing like the company that it was when I started. I mean, it, we now reach into so many different areas. You know, we've grown, you know, eight new billion dollar businesses just in the last 10 years. And you know, we're reaching out into home entertainment, we're reaching out into, in, into enterprise, we've got you know, the huge cloud infrastructure, more and more we're doing, we're doing end user devices, although the you know, company actually, even in the early days, did end user devices. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's just been a, 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 just a change in the whole industry over a period of time, and we've just been part of that. So, so how do you decide, so if you're gonna take on a big new area in research, what goes into that process? Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Is there a is there a recent new large initiative that that is sort of longer term that that comes to mind? Well, I think what happens, you know, the way I look at it isn't so much like you know, I, I don't think of how we you know uh, attack you know the the future as saying you know what are the initiatives that I create that somehow you know cause things to happen. You know, the way I look at my job is, is I hire really, really great people, right? And we try to hire the very best people that we can. And we are, you know, uh, in, in many ways opportunistic in, in those hires. I mean, there are times when you will suddenly have a really great person and you didn't think you were going to be working on that. And, you know, but the, you just really want to hire this really great person. And now suddenly you're doing another area of research that you weren't thinking of doing before. Yeah, and, and so my, the way I look at my job is, is, is the, the most important things I do are to you know, help determine you know, who we hire and who we fire, right? Who, who is our workforce and who are those really top people that are going to be you know, pushing the state of the art? And we, and we let them figure out what they're doing. And, and they will individually take initiative or in groups will take initiatives and tackle new areas. Um. You, you mentioned your, your, you know, the important aspect of bringing the best people to Microsoft. I was just wondering if you, if you felt guilty at all for bringing Peter Lee. He was halfway through his DARPA tour of duty, and you were good enough that you managed to get him to, to sort of drop it and come, come to be the manager of Microsoft Research in, in Redmond. I think that's a higher calling. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I honestly, I mean, I think, you know, you, you know, uh, I, I, in some sense, I never feel bad about hiring a really great person because I think we have an environment where really great people can do extraordinary things and can change the world in a significant way. And if you ask Peter, I think he'd probably say that's why he came to Microsoft because he really wants to change the world. Mm -hmm. And that's why I went to Microsoft because I felt that you know, if I could be successful in creating this kind of, of fundamental basic research lab in the context of a software company like Microsoft, that we could do things that other people weren't doing, you know, and, and you know, again, I think that's that's what gets me excited. And incremental innovation versus disruptive innovation. I, you know, I, I, I knew the guys who basically in research who created, I don't know if it was your first, but the previous tablet um, product from from Microsoft, and it 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 uh, it never was a big. I mean, it, you know, it got in, it got out into the world in very sort of siloed ways. It never sort of had a broad consumer impact, and I. Um, you know, I know that at, uh, at the outset they had much broader, much broader vision, and I just sort of wondered about your sense about that, the evolution of that product that went from research out into the, to the product line, and um, it didn't disrupt. Uh, well, I think that, you know, again, to some extent, you know, whether a product does or doesn't disrupt uh, an environment sometimes depends on the time, right? You know, when is the right time? What is the right form factor? What is the right way in which you, you present it? 
I mean, I think there was a huge amount of innovation in the original Tala PC software. Chuck Thacker, you know, was the person that actually did the original reference design for that. And he, of course, designed the Xerox Alto as well, and mm -hmm. uh, recently won the Turing Award. Um, you know, so I think, you know, it's, uh, there was a lot learned through that product in terms of inking and how the inking worked with the rest of the system. A lot of those learnings have moved their way into other, you know, our current products and, and other things that we're, that we're doing. So you, know, you have to kind of look at each, each area. Something like Connect is a good example where it, there is a, um, you know, a, a set of technology you know, coming out of machine learning and computer vision and then you know, having a, a really disruptive effect. Interestingly enough, it, it had a disruptive effect on the, on the, on the sort of game console business yep. and had a huge financial impact for us, very positive financial impact. Um, and really has you know, kept the Xbox as really the, the, the leader you know, within that space. But even more interestingly, you know, what Connect did is it, it changed everybody's ideas about how people interact with computers. Right? So you've seen, once Connect came out, suddenly there was this sort of sea change in attitude in universities about the research that people were doing. And everybody wanted to work with Connect or they started thinking about other kinds of ways you could use gesture, or other ways in which you could use vision, or other ways that you could use uh, these kinds of technologies, you know, to uh, be able to have the machines interact with with, with the okay. person. And I think you know the you know sometimes again in this case I think the timing was really right. I mean you you know uh, whereas the Tala PC didn't you know it, it was still basically a PC that now just had a new input mechanism. With Connect, you you reached the point where suddenly you had a different relationship with, with the computer or with the game console. I can remember ha bringing the Kinect home and having them start to play with it. And I realized what a tremendous change that was and what a big hit it was going to be when I saw that my, um, my, uh, one of my sons was having just as much fun uh, celebrating because the character on screen celebrated the same way he did, right? When he jumped up and down and celebrated, it moved too. And I realized that his brain had made the connection between him and the character on the screen. That they had suddenly become the same, the same entity and that he was feeling it that way. Cyberspace. Right? right, right. And, and at that point I realized, you know, we've really got something, right? That, that's a big change in your relationship with the computer system. There were some Israeli companies that partnered with you in the, de in the development of Connect, and I was just wondering what, what was their role in the... Uh, well, there was a company called PrimeSense, um, or still is um, PrimeSense, and then you know, they developed the, 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 the sort of chip, right, that okay. that's actually doing the, 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 you know, creating the sort of 3D feel. Okay. Um, but that's not really enough to make Connect work, right, because part of the problem is that is, is first off, it's not super high resolution, and secondly, the if uh, one of the, 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 the traditional problems in computer vision is if all you're doing is just tracking motion, it's very easy to get confused and get behind, right? So objects occlude each other easily, um, and especially when you're talking about doing you know a 3D computer vision in a in in a room with dancing children uh, and dogs. And you know, and all and furniture and all the other things that are there, it's very easy to lose things in that space. So really, what made Connect really magical and, and really work, you know, for consumers was the fact that that um, you know we were able to build this um, machine learning system that really modeled what people did and how they were doing it and what they looked like, so that the system wasn't going to be confused. It sort of had an image of what you were doing. In some sense, it probably knew better than you did what you were going to do next. Um, and it was able to use that to eliminate all the other errors that the tracking system would produce. I wanted to ask you about uh, a, a scientific, you talked about AIDS research, and that, uh, I guess the, the, the distinction between basic science research and uh, applied or engineering research. I mean, computer science is this funny kind of beast. Uh, it's, it's not a pure science in the sense, and yet it's transformed every pure science. Are you, are you shading the lab at all to doing anything 
as you know, as fundamental as a transistor or uh, 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 you call science, pure science in the sense the people in your lab. Well, I mean, we're doing a lot. Of, I mean, I'm not, again, I, I think everybody has their own thing that they like to think of as pure science. I mean, we're doing very, very fundamental uh, uh, basic research in computer science. You look at some of the work, for example, in our research lab in Beijing, where we've been at the leading edge of doing you know, robust, robust principal component analysis, where basically you, you see, so historically, you know, people would look at, at dimensionality as being a problem, you know, really high dimensional uh, uh, data, you know, people would look at it and think, oh, how am I gonna deal with that? Well, one of the things that, that, that we've been able to do in some of that work with uh, Yi Ma is to, uh, is to be able to take these extremely high dimensional data, let's say video data, or you know, oodles and gobs of web pages, or whatever. But something can be represented in an extremely high-dimensional space, and efficiently find, you know, coherent low-dimensional subcomponents. And that's really fundamental mathematics, and yet it has huge implications on how we think about image recognition. You know, we can now take and extract, you know, um, image data out of out of you know pictures that have like 99% noise. I mean, and it's just, it, but. It's recognizing new properties or new underlying properties of the information stream that we weren't really leveraging before. And some of these techniques now, such as re robust principal component analysis, you know, are being used in, in um, uh, 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 medical imagery, for example, especially doing things like MRIs for children, because children won't hold still, right? So, so you produce a stream of images, and now you've got to you know, find out that the coherent underlying image that is the bone or whatever it is you're looking for. So I think the, um, you know, so we, we're doing a lot of sort of very fundamental work. The work we've done in, in, in uh, program analysis really goes back to fundamental innovations in our understanding of type theory and how, how programs actually function and how you, and building fast theorem provers and, and, and how, you, how you're able to do that. Um, I wanted to ask you particularly about your work in deep learning networks and I, I also, sort of wanted to see if you could frame them in the history uh, or the evolution of neural network research. And my sense is that these deep learning networks represent sort of a third wave of neural net uh, science, if you will, and. Yeah, I'm not sure how we count waves, but, but certainly, you know, I think the, you know, the, there's been, you know, w w you know our, some of our original work goes back to, you know, there's a paper from 2009 in, uh, where we talked about using these deep neural networks as a way of dramatically improving uh, s speech recognition. You know, we're, we're now using that in, in a number of our products. And I get and the sense so that you're getting uh, really dramatic uh, increases in, in performance or accuracy from these techniques compared to this kind of advances you were getting in the using Bayesian techniques, that this is actually meaningfully. Yeah, that means the, 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 the results we've gotten right now is we're about 30% better That's like than anything that. we were able, able to do before, which is a huge jump for one change for one underlying change of the technology. Although the networks take, take a long time to, uh, to train. I think the one I was ex experimenting with, a, a more recent version uh, that our team uh, was doing, and they, they were explaining to me it, was, uh, it took six months to train the, the model you know, for this particular system. It was working really well for me. But I think this is an example of, you know, ag you know, again, getting better understanding. You go back. I mean, this what sort of modern sort of deep neural networks, you know, go back to sort of 2006, you know, 2005-ish time frame, as people start to understand, you know, uh, better some of the underlying mathematics for how these these multi-level neural networks actually function, and could learn to tune them better, you know, to be able to find underlying characteristics in the data. I, I want to ask you. Uh, I, I noticed that in what you were interviewed recently um, uh, on the anniversary of the Turing uh, Turing's anniversary, and you, you got repeatedly asked about the Turing test. But I wanted to ask a slightly different question, rather than the the illusion of intelligence. Given these kinds of speed ups, what are your sort of feelings about the possibility of what's called strong AI? Do you have a a, a view one way or the other? Uh, uh, I guess I would say I probably don't personally have a strong view. Uh, you know, uh, having you know worked in 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 you know clinical neurolinguistic, I, I'm not sure we we're, we're a ways from understanding exactly what intelligence actually is and how to characterize it. Uh, I mean, I mean certainly there are times when you know I've interacted with 
you know, some bureaucrat, it, it's some agency, and I wasn't really sure I was dealing with an, an intelligent, <laughs> a, an intelligent entity. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, I guess the way I would look at it is, is will we get these systems to the point where they are, you know, you, know uh, you can interact with them in a very natural way, and they can do real things for you and help you solve problems that you have? Um, I think the answer is yes, we're already making, a, we've made a lot of progress in that direction. Uh, you know, where, where, you know, where did it go from there? I mean, I like the, the comment about the disaster day, you know, which is, you know, are the, are the intelligent things going to take over the world or something, you know, uh, and eliminate us? Well, you know, <laughs> you know, maybe, but I, I'm not going to hold my breath. Uh, let me start with this one, because I, I, I know you, uh, your honor, have recently joined the, the Anita Borg Institute board. Uh, I think I'm actually one of the oldest members of the okay, board. Okay, <laughs> so you've been a member for, <laughs> for a long time. So. Uh, Th this person asks, thanks for sharing, Rick. In your research center, among 850 PhDs, how many are women? Among your direct reports, how many are women? Out of how many? Uh, let's see. So I, you know, you're asking me questions I have to do math on and on a cutoff. So uh, uh, roughly about 18% of our researchers are women. That's in line with the sort of national statistics uh, that, you know, uh, unfortunately are falling. So if you look at the national level, uh, the number of women getting degrees in computer science is dropping and do we know right at the same time when the number of people getting degrees in computer science is, is going up. Do you know why that, uh, do you have a theory or is there an explanation? Uh, you know, I, 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 I guess I, there are lots of things I think contribute to it. One is I think we do a really poor job in our schools in not just for women but for students in general in terms of teaching them what you know, engineering and science and computer science are really like. Uh, you know, the, you know, there's a, a significant effort afoot now to, you know, try to find ways to reform the, the system and introduce computer science into, you know, the K through 12. Uh, Brad Smith from Microsoft, you know, recently gave a speech at the Brookings Institute on that. Um, there's a coalition of companies and organizations that, that seem to be focused on that and trying to come up with, with productive, you know, ideas, you know, for being able to have that type of an impact. But certainly I think that's part of it. I think also the field of computer science, we've not done ourselves a lot of favors in terms of the way we, we, we image and project the field, you know, to women. Uh, I think many young women, and frankly many of their parents and their guidance counselors don't think of, of computer science as a, as a, a good place for women to be. Uh, we haven't really explained that it's a way to change the world, um, and we haven't really explained that um, that it isn't just about you know sitting in a cubicle by yourself and programming, but in fact, the, the you know, modern creation of software it is in a very collaborative, you know, very shared experience where lots of people, designers, you know, program managers, coders, testers, everybody gets together you know, and work, works on something. So I think we need to do a better job of that. Uh, so I think those are, you know, some of the factors, but we just need to do, you know, we need to do a better job. And we need to do a better job of keeping women into the field once they get into the field, because that's been a, a problem as well. They tend, women tend to drop out of, out of the technology um, area twice as fast as men do. Uh, there's a question that relates to that. Having attracted great talent to Microsoft, A, how do you reach and B, how do you inspire? Uh, well, I think the way you retain talent is you create an environment where people really want to work. I mean, we, we try to create an environment where people feel like they're very productive, they have the resources that they need, there's a minimal amount of bureaucracy. You know, so for example, you know, uh, one of the things that you know, we do is we, we don't have budgets for research projects, right? So, so you know, people don't, I mean, yes, at some level I have to worry about how much money Microsoft Research spends, but that's really my problem. That's not a problem that the individual researchers have to think about. If they need something, they, they get it. If they don't need it, they're not actually supposed to ask for it because they don't need it, right? And it, you want to create a sense of personal responsibility, but also a sense that, that you know, you don't, this, is, this isn't the, what you should be thinking about. This isn't the barrier you should be concerned about. Um, you should be worrying about coming up with great ideas or pushing the state of the art in your area or finding the weak point in that intellectual frontier. 
you, you shouldn't be worried about how much it's going to cost. We'll figure out how to, how to pay you and how to pay for the things that you need. To that point, I, I, last week I was on Microsoft's West Campus, which didn't exist the last time I was at Microsoft, actually. And I, I you know, this is based on one morning's wandering around. So, uh, you know, I, traditionally I felt that Microsoft was a little bit, um, sort of, it didn't have the flavor of a Google. Um, or you know, of, a, of a, any particular Silicon Valley company that was on a roll, the Silicon Valley company of the, mo of the moment. But this campus, I thought, had that kind of a feeling um, of being all-inclusive and being, you know, full of activity and being sort of opulent, too, in a sense. And is that, was that intentional? Have you done something different on the West Campus to make it a, a really great place to work? Well, I think, in general, Microsoft has worked really hard over the last few years to, you know, um, you know do a wide variety of things that really improve life for, for employees. So, you know, both we've, we've upgraded facilities on the campus. We've made it, you know, there's, there's, there's some, uh, the, it, that's not always, you know, just altruistic. You know, if, if people can get, you know, things done on campus, then they don't, go, they don't leave, right? right? They keep working. You know, they go back to their offices afterwards. Get your hair cut and then go back to your office, right? <laughs> uh, so th th there's that aspect. But, but, uh, but we've done things too. We, we've um, you know, created the connector bus system you know, that goes now all the way through the Puget Sound area. So we have these Wi-Fi equipped buses that bring people in from Seattle and Duval and Woodinville and, and, and Federal Way and so forth. And that's, that's been a huge improvement, especially for a lot of younger empl you know, new employees that, that you know, maybe not have, don't have enough money to live close to campus. Right you know, they're, they're going to find be housing elsewhere, but now they, they have an easy way to get into campus and, you know, they've got, you know, access to Wi-Fi and other services <laughs> while they're traveling so they don't have to feel disconnected. Is there that San Francisco Peninsula thing where the young, hip people all live in Seattle and Belltown and they like to... You know, I, I think people are pretty distributed. I mean, you, I certainly know a bunch of uh, people that do love living in, in the city, you know, and then, and of course, different districts have different flavors in Seattle, and I think that's part of the charm of, of Seattle. You know, and then I, you know, I know people that like living out in the country. You know, they like living up in Woodinville or in Duval, you know, Monroe, where you know these are really more like you know out in the middle of the country, and and you know there's cows and and horses and things like that. So looking ahead, what are the most important areas of computer science for Microsoft to be the best in the world? And then in parentheses, don't say quote all unquote. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly goal is if we're going to be doing research in an area, we should be at the state of the art. I mean, we, I mean, if you look at today, I mean, Microsoft Research is the number one publisher of basic research in the field of computer science. You know, and you know, we, you know, I, I, I think of what we do as really being, you know, pushing the state of the art in all these different areas. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm trying to try and think, I'm, I, I can't think of a good way to pick you know, winners and losers, you know, out of that space. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that are really important. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of progress being made right now in machine learning. You know, and that's, that's a critical technology. Uh, it's, a, it's an area that we've been making pretty heavy investments in now for a very long time. And I think they're really starting to pay off in a significant way. But as I said before, I mean, some of the, the investments we've made in, you know, program analysis or investments that we've made in, um, in you know, fundamental mathematics or single processing, those are also paying off in really significant ways too. And y often you don't realize how something like that's gonna pay off until it really does, right? I mean, the, one of the, the sort of good things and bad things about basic research is that you, know, you don't necessarily have a plan for what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're constantly exploring, you're thinking of ideas, you're pushing, you know, in any place that you can that looks like it's going to give, you know, on that frontier. And, you know, and when you do that, surprising things come out. And sometimes you don't know that they're really that interesting until three or four years later, you know. And, uh, and then sometimes the things that look really promising right now turn out to be nothing three or four years from now, you know, because there's some hidden flaw that you didn't see right away. So I think it's, the, it's this willingness to be sort of invested not so much in, in ideas but in people. Right, because people are the one. The people are the things that are going to produce the, the steady stream of new ideas. You know, and I, and I don't try to manage technologies. I don't try to manage what we do. I just try to make sure that we have the best people we have, and that they're as productive as they can be, and that you know, and that I'm, I'm you know, giving them a, a way, a, a 
to, to sort of realize whatever their dream is, you know, within the, their space. Let me ask a final question. Um, uh, so your lab, uh, Microsoft Research, has done very interesting research in a, in a problem that I guess is described as dark silicon. Um, uh, we are reaching fundamental limits where you can't keep all the switches on a, a, a modern piece of silicon active at the same time because of fundamental limits in heat, the heat that's produced. Where are you on the limits uh, that, uh, where are we in Moore's Law? Um, is the party as close to being over as some of the doomsayers say, or um, is, are we simply going to shift technologies and keep moving at the same, at the same pace? You know, so I, I guess I've always had the belief that Moore's Law is more about us than it is about computers. You know, it's about uh, you know, the fundamental belief that we've had in the technology field for some time now that we can keep solving ever greater and ever harder problems. And we keep coming up with some new, uh, new way to do it. You know, if you look at what we're doing today, you know, we're building these enormous data centers. We're collecting, you know, astronomical amounts of petabytes of data. And we're, and we're extracting information from that data that is helping us solve fundamental problems, whether that be you know, environmental issues, uh, health problems, uh, you know, really you know, you know, coming into sort of fundamental understandings of things like how speech recognition really works or how computers really work. And so in that sense, I think you know, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, I, you know, individual technologies are going to come and go. And they have for, for some, some period of time. I mean, at some point, you know, we're all going to be standing around saying, yo, electricity, how quaint, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, you know, no, nobody does anything with like, electricity anymore. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, you know I, I, I think that's, that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the way I think the future is going to be. You know, if, if we get stuck someplace, we'll find another way. You know, we'll find a way around it. Not because the technology allows us to do it, but, but because we, choose to do it. I've asked about a third of the questions I wanted to ask, but we're out of time. Thank you very much for Thank you. taking the time. Thank you. The work of Rick Rashid and his team ranges from mobile computing to artificial intelligence, human-computer interaction, and the future of high-speed computation. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Please join us next time for another episode of Revolutionary.